Hit it. It's Friday, April 1st, 2022, episode 174. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we have the great privilege of welcoming Chesapeake Capital founder Jerry Parker. We talk about answering the Richard Dennis turtle ad, why he believes in trend following plus nothing, and finally, how to adapt that strategy to Fantasy Hockey League. Then Patrick is all alone and no longer has last week's Talking Charts pal with him. So we see if he can still manage to hold our interest with his voodoo technical magic. And then we end with our segments of No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. Kev, I think I lost a stake to you. I'm going to have to talk this through. And then, folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We got a great show. Lena, hop on. What beer am I drinking today? So today, Patrick is drinking Villa Maria Blonde Ale from, oh, goodness, it's Portuguese, <laughs> Oitava Colina Brewery. Mm-hmm. It's delish. Let me just give it a shot. Patrick, are you back in Portugal? It? Yeah, I'm in Lisbon again. <laughs> uh, Seriously? I, I, I'm moving around a little bit. I didn't realize that, actually. <laughs> that you were in Mexico. <laughs> Oh, we'll, we'll review the beer afterwards. All right. Lena, uh, do you want to do a plug for the merch? Yes, please visit our uh, merch store at markethuddlemerch.com and show us some love and get some Lord of Crayons merch and Market Huddle swag. All right. Let me do our side effects. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include boxed wine motor malfunction. Long duration fed phobia <laughs> and anaphylactic prairie dog shock. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get Jerry on. It's our great pleasure to welcome to the show Jerry Parker, the chairman and executive officer of Chesapeake Capital. Jerry, thanks for thanks for coming on the market huddle today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited. <laughs> so when uh, our pal Mike, who I hear is is uh, one of your friends and a, and a bitter uh, rival when it comes to your hockey fantasy league, which we're going to have to talk a little bit about eventually. When he uh, made the introduction, it, it started with, and I saw uh, Jerry was w- one of the original turtles. And I think I hit, yes, please. I'd love to meet him immediately after I heard that. It was, it was that quick. But then I learned, I was going through all the turtles and I was going through all the different uh, how they've all done, and I realized not only have I gotten the original turtle, I've probably gotten the most successful one. So I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, why don't we tell, start a little bit uh, talking about your uh, background and how you became what uh, part of probably one of the most famous stories in all of the Market Wizards. Sure. Um, well, uh, in 1983, I was working in public accounting in uh, Richmond, Virginia, desperately wanting to not work in public accounting and do something more fun and um, interesting and creative. So I just happened to answer that uh, ad in the Wall Street Journal from Richard Dennis that said, um, I'm looking to hire some traders and we'll teach them how to trade and then we'll give them money to manage and we'll give them a percentage of the profits Moved, moved them to Chicago, and I thought, yes, this is exactly <laughs> what I need to do. I had uh, practiced and learned and read about trading and trend following, not knowing that it was going to be about trend following, but hoping that it was. So I was ready. I was prepared, and I kind of knew this was going to be a great opportunity. I'd heard Richard Dennis, and uh, I knew it wasn't, um, you know, a scam, and I, and so that's what I did, and I was lucky enough to get the job. So I was actually fascinated to find out that you weren't exposed to trend following from Richard Dennis, and that you had actually already discovered it on your own. What did, where did you read about it, and and and, and why don't you explain to people what trend following is? Because although I, I guess a lot of people might understand the basic concept, uh, a little more kind of flushing out would probably be in order. Sure. I um, Well, I watched Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser on public TV, and Marty Zwag was on there, a famous right. stock trader, and he's yeah. written some books, which I highly recommend. Um, and he sort of dabbled in trend following a bit, you know, and uh, I got the newsletter, I read the newsletters, and I 
Uh, he had uh, phone updates twice a week. I dialed the phone update. So I was really into it. And it wasn't that hard to, you know, find other uh, material, magazines or articles and about trend following. And, you know, there was no internet at the time. So it would have been much easier if it had been internet and I could have really researched it. But the trend following is, um, the cliche is take small losses and let profits run. And I think that's the core of it. That's the genius. That's the wonder, the magic of it is, you know, you can, diversification is a big deal and taking short trades is good. So we, we trade uh, stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies. And, um, and so we have a, a very diverse portfolio and we have some shorts in those markets as well. But really it is, you're going to put, have a predetermined stop loss. If the trade turns into a loss, you'll get out and it'll be small relative to your capital base. But if that trade turns into a profit, you're going to be very bold. You're going to let that profit go. You're going to sit with some volatility and some drawdowns because hopefully you'll get a really big winner. So it really is a situation of we're going to handle the winners and losers much differently. And so the big question, the big question is, will the winners pay for the losers? It sounds so good. Right. Easy. Uh, of course, this is a great idea. I loved it. I thought it was going to be just fantastic and uh, without having any evidence, of course. And that's really the key. Will your winners pay for all of these small losers? Because the small losers can add up. So yeah. I tell you what, unfortunately, we haven't progressed much beyond that basic philosophy, but thankfully it's worked really well for almost 40 years. Now, do you think there was something in your personality that attracted you to that? Because most people would have read Marty Zweig and wanted to do, you know, don't fight the Fed or a bunch of different things. And yet you gravitated to this part of trend following. Do you have any insights or on reflection why that might be? Well, I think it had a lot to do with my desire to um, be more objective and objective rules and, um, and then not to have to do too much work. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to, I, I mean, I was, I was in accounting. I majored in accounting at uh, UVA and I was in public accounting. So I was, I knew about balance sheets and income statements but I, I certainly did not want to be a value person or a stock person who had to uh, focus on, uh, you know, on, on that boring stuff where just following trends seemed uh, so much more fun. And um, I would have so much free time, uh, you know, because, it, you know, you put the trade on, if it goes up, you just sit with it for a long time. So it really, when, when I worked for Richard Dennis, you know, we really um, had a lot of free time on our hands. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about this, because from my understanding, uh, a thousand people or so applied for these positions. And there was, what, 20 positions. And they took a variety of different people with different backgrounds. And not only that, they also scored them. And if I've got my facts right, you scored the highest out of all of the other uh, contestants on this. And it also coincided that you ended up being the one that was the most successful coming out of it. But I, I was wondering, what, why the variety? Like, why didn't they just take the top 20 different individuals? What were they trying to accomplish? Well, I think they wanted to uh, have mostly, you know, smart people. And so they asked us our SAT score. Like you said, they sent a test out, a 100-question uh, true-false test with five uh, discussion questions as well that always gets lost in the, uh, in the, in, in, dis you know, remembering what exactly happened, but there were five discussion questions. So I did really well on that test, the hundred true false test. And, um, but they wanted people with different backgrounds. We had a chess player, an actor, a backgammon player, um, blackjack players, um, programmers uh, back in the day, you know, the, whatever that meant to program. It wasn't a lot of programming going on, I guess. A book, uh, a guy who wrote children's books and was the <laughs> founder, worked for Dungeons and Dragons, the, get, oh, the game company. Wow. Yeah. So it was a lot of, uh, and then there were some people who were just friends or people who had, um, you know, asked Rich to hire them. And he said, well, uh, let's wait for the turtle program. I'm going to do a turtle program. So there was some charity cases as well. 
and okay. friends. And so, and so how many of you, how many of you were there? Twelve the first year and eight the second year. Oh, it wasn't that big. I thought it was big. Oh, I guess I thought it was twenty the first year and then more more than that. Okay, so you get you twelve, you show up, and it's Richard and what's his partner's name? Is it, um, I've always forgotten that part of the story. Bill Eckhart. Oh yeah, Bill. That's right. So Bill and Richard are there, and to most people, is the market completely new? Like trading new? Obviously, you had been watching uh, Lewis. Kaiser and uh, and Marty Zweig, but were a lot of them just kind of what is this market and you know what 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 is a wheat contract? Sorta, of, yeah. You know, um, I think so. I think that the, most people, at least half the uh, group, were sort of new. Okay. Uh, in the interview, one, there was one funny question. Um, in hindsight, it's kind of funny, but it was rich. I think they asked everyone in the in the interview. Maybe so. Maybe there were forty people who got interviews okay. the first the first year. So uh, he asked, uh, "How much do you think you already know about trading?" And um, I know one person said, "Oh, probably like ninety nine percent." And uh, I think I said like ninety. You know, that's so oh. embarrassing. Oh, horrible! <laughs> and then uh, the only woman that they hired said close to zero. And so there you have that's a that's a psychological experiment there that the the woman was the one who was going to be more humble and 100% right because we really didn't know very much any of us even gotcha. if we had been trading even if we knew something about the wheat contract we didn't really know what we needed to know in a scientific mathematical way that we were going to be taught so when you show up to the class is the first step to uh, kind of erase your minds of everything you think you know Pretty much, yeah. Um, one of Rich's favorite things was to do some research, do some back testing, and prove cliches incorrect. So he loved to do that. Um, like a popular cliche would be something like, "You can't go broke taking profits," and so he could pretty much prove that you absolutely would go broke if you took profits too quickly. So it that flies against uh, you know taking small losses but then letting your profits run and hoping that they're going to be much bigger. So um, I think most of our inclinations and original ideas were probably pretty wrong. Okay. So they, they tell you that everything that you've learned before is wrong. And then they try to, uh, let's just say, pass along the wisdom that they've learned trading. And maybe you could distill it in a, in, in a, in a, in a little soundbite for us? Of course. Um, once again, uh, take small losses. <clears throat> um, we're going to let the profits run. Our average, we're going to have a 40% success rate on the trades, 60% losing trades. So we need these trades, these winning trades to be very large. And you can, you must resist. The most important thing is to resist getting out too quickly. Uh, don't let the volatility or the size of the profit You'll have a systematic approach with some rules. Please just follow these rules. And um, we'll trade very large and we'll trade with a lot of leverage. We were averaging about 200% a year with very large fluctuations. So we will have another rule that says when you're losing money, trade smaller. So we would have a defensive posture if we went into a drawdown and, and started losing um, you know, material amount. We would trade smaller to try to stem that uh, drawdown and then go right back to this higher leverage when we started making money again. Then I would say the second most important thing would be diversification, lots of markets, longs and shorts, um, currencies, commodities, stocks and bonds. We traded about 20 markets then. I trade about 180 now. So that's gotten a lot better to, um, <clears throat> to um, in that regard. And then the overall philosophy would be, you know, the whole course was we're not teaching you something that's good for today, for the 80s. It's going to be good forever. We're going to give you these broad philosophical principles that, yes, the markets will change over time, but you should be able to navigate these uh, changes. And um, uh, you should be able to, one of these days, if we could have predicted Bitcoin, you'll be fine. You can trend follow you can use your trend following on Bitcoin even or Tesla. And underscoring all of this uh, general philosophy was is that trading is hard. Trading should be painful. 
Uh, it should be hard to do. And you should not seek ease, comfort, and pleasure, but you really, the best ideas, the best rules are going to be very difficult. Profits are going to turn into losses. Big profits are going to turn into losses or small profits. Losing trades all the time, you know, 40%, 30% winning, tra- uh, winning trades. So hard uh, to, to live like that and um, watch the fluctuations in your open trades. Or it's going to really scare you. Um, so it was really just getting us to a place where we were changing our whole philosophy of what worked in the markets and what works in life. You know, what works in life is doing the hard thing, doing the right thing. That was a common uh, phrase that was repeated often. Now, do you think that that's the reason that it works is because, and, and, and it can last decades, is because it's so difficult to do and human beings don't change? I do. I think that's a big part of it. <clears throat> I don't think necessarily that it's, it is somewhat important to not have everybody trend following, I suppose. So you don't have a too crowded of a space. But every day when I talk to other people, friends, clubhouse, Twitter, I'm just reminded that for human beings to sit with a big profit and watch it fluctuate, and really, if they follow their rules, it could absolutely turn into a small profit or a loss. It's almost the most hardest thing for anyone to do. I've never met a trader who didn't agree that their biggest problem was, or biggest regrets, was getting out too quickly. So I think that is just part of the game, is that in order, the market is almost telling us, I'll give you money. I'll let you take a bit out of me, but it is going to be painful. You're not going to like it. It's not going to fit your personality. It's going to take years off your life, maybe. I'm joking, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now, one of the things that we haven't talked about as well is the fact that you're buying strength or selling weakness. So it's, it's not that you're, you're not going against the trend. You're going with the trend. And often that means buying a higher price and in anticipation of hopefully selling it even higher. There has to be an element of different market regimes or different periods are more conducive or more profitable for that type of strategy, right? Oh, sure. The one we're currently in, you know, we, we traded these commodities. We've had a commitment 50, 40, 50% to commodities for 40 years. So the commodities after a 20 year, you know, lull have finally, we're making all this money. So we'll trade things and have things in our portfolio that have not really experienced good trends in a long time. But now, you know, we're, we're gotta, we've got to make hay because these commodities are just unbelievable. The grains, the metals, the LME metals, pretty much the base metals, and then um, crude, heating oil, unleaded. Uh, but I've never seen such great commodity markets almost in my entire career. And this is, um, you know, obviously this is what we wait for in all of these markets. And the most important thing being when it, when it comes and it looks like all the other trades that were losers, you have to suck it up and do the trade and then you get rewarded. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking about Professor Michael with his uh, belief in, in the efficient market. And I'm trying to coincide or kind of reconcile where you come down in terms of believing he is incorrect and why you believe your trend following will make money over the long run for, for almost forever? <laughs> well, I think that even some of the efficient market people, they sort of uh, do, do, do give trend following or momentum a pass and say, oh yeah, there is this one anomaly that it does look like the markets are not a bell curve. It's a non-normal distribution. There are fat tails. Okay. And so I think these fat tails, they're really out there now. There's so many of them now, it's really not uh, anything to argue about. But um, yeah, so I think in this today's world with all the crazy things happening in the war and crypto and Tesla, 
you know, it's not hard to convince people that um, if you wait long enough, you may see something you've never seen before. We keep seeing it over and over. And it's just our job to um, have that particular market in our portfolio and put that trade on. So I, I might suggest that it has to do with moments where the world's changing will be more profitable for trend following and that uh, instability of any of any sort will also be more uh, kind of profitable. And not only that, the most important thing to me is the fact that break, not breakouts, but when the environment changes, we're going to be in a situation where everyone's still doing the old thing. And one of the things that to me, the trend following is great is the fact that you don't think about it. You don't sit around and try to determine what's the price of Bitcoin. You just buy it because it's going up. Or <laughs> or oil, even oil, you talk about it'd be great, but it was also great on the downside, if I'm not wrong, for you guys as well, right? In terms of, oh, on the on the other side, you, you a lot of trend followers caught the short. That's right, 2020. You know, really the, the heart of all of this is you can't predict. No one knows where these markets are going. And sometimes just the most simplest, uh, 2020 was just an was evidence of, um, you know, COVID, the COVID period, the start of COVID was just a evidence of the simplest systems were the best, whichever systems just got you out of the longs and into the shorts was the best quickly as possible. Just a simple breakout because everything went down. The stocks went down, the bonds went down, the currencies went down, commodities went down. Uh, there was no diversification to be had. I think I was up 10% for the year. And then all of a sudden I was break even. But if I had to put, you know, if you just go ahead and follow your rules and put that, put those shorts on, you're pretty quickly making all of that back and more. So it really is a situation where um, every day you're just banging your head up against the wall, doing these seemingly inconsequential trades and 95% of them are pretty inconsequential. And then the five or 10% that make all the money and that have these outlier moves uh, you get paid back, but it is a very frustrating and, uh, you know, another thing that human beings like a lot is frequent trades, frequent um, being reminded how wonderful they are very fre frequently. <laughs> this is the opposite of that. You know, we're, we're never, it's seldom are we, are we sort of reminded how great our ideas are and our strategies are. So this is another thing. People want positive feedback very frequently. That's why taking profits and getting out of trades quickly and short-term trading and just just the smallest profit, taking the smallest profit just makes people so happy and excited. So pursuing unhappiness and not taking those small profits is really the way to make the most amount of money. It's hard to do. Right. Now, you you talked about how uh, all the trades went down during 2020 and, and, and then in the subsequent uh, 2021, we, we've seen them all go up. How do you deal with the fact that you might have a portfolio that is long a variety of different instruments that are all correlated to the same um, factors? And how do you think about that? And, and do you adjust your sizing based upon uh, correlations amongst your portfolio? I don't adjust it based upon the current correlations. I build the portfolio weightings um, based upon more of a long-term correlation. I mean, I know the bonds are kind of correlated. I know the commodities, some of the sectors in the commodities, the energy markets will be sort of correlated, the grain markets, precious metals a bit, um, currencies somewhat. And I know that all the sectors can become more correlated or less correlated, but it is a problem. If you have a systematic approach where you're continuing just to follow these rules, and the rules really don't take into consideration the current correlations. You're just going to get yourself in a situation where you're, you know, like like in February 2020, we're just long and there's no shorts. And it's always better to have some shorts on. And I think back in that period, I was uh, all the stocks that I were long uh, that I had in my portfolio. I was pretty much long all of those as well. And so now it's much different. You see uh, now. And part, part of uh, last year and this year, 
a lot of my stocks that I trade that are in my portfolio, they're in downtrends and some are in uptrends. So it's now a much different, much better. But, um, you know, I'm sort of short every single bond future <laughs> that you could think of. <laughs> um, short oh. almost 80, 75, 80% of the currencies versus the dollar, long a few and long every single commodity. I mean, come on. It's just ridiculous. But, you know, the, this is what we say to ourselves. Um, I've got the losses taken care of. So I'm not going to classify um, the drawdown on profitable trades as a loss. The loss is a losing trade. So I'm going to convince myself that this is an unfortunate drawdown. Oh, I, granted, I, I'm not happy with losing money on profitable trades, but it really is a profitable trade. So when you do the back test and you do the analysis, the computer says you're going to make a lot of money, but it's going to be some really uncomfortable periods that you may have never even seen before, and you're not going to be happy with giving back a lot of this profit. But I really, you know, I've spent my career trying to find something better, and I have yet to come up with it. Because if I tweak that, then that may screw up another period in history. So really, you're just left with following these simple you know, uh, breakout rules is what I use. And, and is that not that much different than the original uh, turtle uh, system? Shockingly similar. This really makes gets people upset that what have you done for 40 years? Haven't you improved? <laughs> <laughs> and I say that to myself as well. And I would, I want to, you know, and I have uh, made some false moves, some moves that I've regretted uh, where I have, you know, changed the original rules but uh, the most important thing about changing the rules, and I have changed them in a material way, and that is it just became mandatory to be longer term. So a 20-day breakout, you know, buy the 20-day high, sell the 20-day low, that's 1983. Now we're more like buy the 200-day high, sell the 200-day low. So the markets, we still have the trends, but they're very choppy and they're very volatile. So in order to make the big money, to hold on to a trade for a year or two, this is our strategy. Um, some of these you know, long-term trends, they last a year or two or three. You really have to have um, what we call loose pants. You know, we have to have loose pants. We have to, which lets a lot of things uh, fit. You know, we, a lot of scenarios can fit with these long-term parameters, because in order to capture those outlier trades, you really need to let the market have some volatility, have some sell-offs, because most of the time it'll go right back to the highs and keep on going. Okay. So can I ask when you made this discovery that you had to extend the length of your uh, breakouts in terms of, you know, widen it out and make your pants a little bit looser, so to speak? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that was like the late 90s, you know, okay. the late 90s. And the good thing about that was that, um, you know, I came out of a culture of high volatility, relatively short-term trend following. So it takes a while to break out. You know, you don't, you don't we, we bought software, we could do our own back testing, but you still, and, we, and I started Chesapeake in 1988. So I worked for was in a turtle program for four years, but you don't immediately come out of that and say, oh, now I will just be so open-minded and uh, challenge everything that I've been taught. Right. It just took a while for us, for me to, um, you know, test these longer term ideas and the longer term look backs. And so, but the good news is that when we looked at the longer term uh, holding periods, they had performed well in the 80s as well. So it wasn't like we were cherry picking recent data and seeing, oh, now the long term starts to work. No, long term had always worked, uh, but it was the short term that had sort of stopped working. And do you think the short term had stopped working because of more participants that were aware of the strategy? Or did the environment change and like we, we went from a period of inflation in the late early 80s um, to to more of a financialization of the world? I think it was uh, too many people, too many computers, too many short-term traders. 
with tick data. Um, and yeah, to, people love to trade shorter term. I mean, I am an advocate of shorter term. The shorter term, the better. The problem is if you get too short term, it doesn't make money for me. You know, for me, some people uh, have, um, you know, the really short term traders, they almost market makers. They're really successful. I'm not, but for us normal people, us mortals, uh, not the Renaissance, you know, the Renaissance guys do their thing, but us other mortals, we have to uh, take what the market will give us and what our talents will give us. And so um, it, it definitely helps to stay away from the crowd. Now, do you think that, like, did you explore going as short as intraday, like that short, or were you always much more of a day to day trader? Day to day. Okay. Um, I never looked at the short term. I never was interested in it. I wanted to be able to say, do you remember that big trade in 1990, heating oil in December, it doubled in price? Yes, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to make sure you were long those. And I guess that's really the, the, the part of the strategy that seems so easy to say, but probably tough to do, because if you miss that trade, and if you're not part of that heating oil trade if you miss the tesla if you miss the bitcoin rally because you whatever you know you you felt it was overpriced or you couldn't get yourself to buy buy it because it, it was uh, elon musk was you know tweeting something ridiculous it ends up being that you missed the trade that would have made your year there you go i mean that's the secret you know people always want to say um uh, exits are more important exit you know where do you get out of the trade it's much more important than the entry. Well, I think I know what they're getting at. And that is when you have a big, huge profit, you know, it's going to matter. If, are you medium term or are you long term? I like to be both. I like to have multiple entries, multiple exits. So when I, when I have to get out of this mega trade, this trade that has made me so much money, I like to spread my exits around and not just have um, one spot. And so I understand that the difference between getting out quicker or later could be a lot different. You know, sometimes if you get out quicker, it goes right back up. And then sometimes if you get out quicker, it keeps going down. So that's going to make a big, uh, a big deal in some of these trades, especially the ones I'm currently in. So, However, there's nothing more important than doing the trade. I mean, oh my God, you got to do it. Right. One uh, first commandment of trend following is do not miss a trend. That's why we have 40% winners because we're always buying these breakouts and they suck. They don't go anywhere. We're the, we have no clue what's happening. Our prediction is the worst. No one is worse than us. We just have to hope that our winners are about two and a half to three times as big as our losers. Uh, I'd love to talk about the exit a little more so I can understand it. Um, I'm assuming you're not looking at it and saying it's overbought here. I'm going to, I'm going to peel some out. And in fact, you're using the same sort of trend following in terms of a stop loss from like a drawdown from the high or something of that nature. Would that be a correct assumption? That's right. And, and, and again, that's just to make sure you let the right tail be as fat as it wants to be. That's right. It, and we've done the back test and the back test says, Yes, this is how you make a lot of money. Um, you know, let that let that market turn around. As painful as it might be, a lot of these trades, when they, you get really afraid, they do sell off and they go right back to the highs and keep going. Now, one of the things that when you talk about the back test, I, I guess what I wanted to, what I picture is people sitting around and optimizing it for corn or optimizing it for gold. And I'm wondering that that probably has the problem of over-optimization and, and, and really making it seem better than it is. Do you take the one strategy and apply it on a variety of different commodities or will the parameters change depending on each uh, different asset? Well, you're so correct. Optimization is a huge problem. The backtesting in general is a huge problem. I. I'm really afraid of the back test. I try to take away as little as possible from the back test. The world is going to change. It's going to, the fundamentals are going to change in the future. It's not going to look like the past. I just want some sort of a simple buy, sell, you know, one entry, one exit, and a stop loss that keeps me in these long-term trends when I know the future is going to look much different. And you can kind of prove that optimizing per market doesn't work. Uh, so we 
we optimize over the entire group of markets. So all you know, 100 plus markets, currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds, we throw them all in there and we just use parameters that work the best on the whole group. And one of the fun things is, is there's just this sweet spot in the parameter uh, options where all of the choices make about the same amount of money. So you're not trying to find this needle in a haystack. It's like you can't, you can't not make money, you know, something like a hundred day breakout to a 200 day breakout. They all make about the same amount of money. Now, I, I, so it, it's really comforting to know that it's really difficult to go wrong. When, when I listen to your other um, previous podcast appearances and uh, your Twitter spaces and all the other wonderful things you do, I, I realize that you'll be talking about ATRs. Why don't you explain to people what they are and it, does that make the entries, uh, let's just say, adaptive to how volatile the different uh, financial assets are? Yes, exactly. So ATR, average true range, it's on the internet. Google that. I won't spend time trying to define it. But it just basically says, it's a formula, simple formula that just basically says, hey, if the market is volatile, we'll trade it smaller. If it doesn't have very much volatility at all, we'll trade it a lot larger. So we want to make each one of these trades, which I'll call bets, we want to make these bets kind of equal. So I might buy one or two S&Ps and uh, tw 20 or 30 Swiss francs. But based upon its recent volatility, in my mind, they're pretty much the same bet. They have the same juice in them. They're going to have uh, the possibility of making you know similar amounts of money. And I'll just use that. It'll, it'll uh, figure out my quantity for me of how many I want to buy of each. And I'll try to normalize my losing trades and lose the same amount of money on each market and give each market the same room to go against me before I get out. But yeah, it's a way to uh, create real diversification because, you know, a typical stock is a lot more volatile than a typical um, grain market, wheat or corn or the Swiss franc. So you need to delever the stocks, lever up the commodities and the currencies, et cetera, so you can really have this amazing diversification, real diversification. Uh, which you could expect both markets to contribute equally to the returns and the losses. Now, when you get into the trade, you set your your the maximum you're going to uh, willing to lose, and assuming it doesn't get through your stop, you you've you've set that. But then, very quickly, hopefully, or, or, or at some point, it becomes profitable, and we have this open uh, P and L. And at that point, as well, the volatility might be changing. So when you buy let's just use oil uh, you buy oil and next thing you know there's a war in the U ukraine and now or you're on side but oil's moving around a lot kind of quicker and a lot bigger jumps do you change your atrs to reflect the new reality or do you uh, use the initial entry atr that was set when you first put on this the position well i'm in the minority on this I just admit that, and um, but I don't change the position. In my mind, when the volatility, the ATR increases, um, this is part of why I'm going to make more money. This is part of the benefit I have of letting profits run, letting the, and not trying to micromanage that risk. And I define risk as the permanent loss of capital. So. Um, a lot of times I do, I risk 25 basis points per trade. I lose 25 and that's a bummer. But once I have this mega profit, like in crude, um, I don't classify the gyrations in crude, the sell-offs, the rallies, the volatility as risk. It's a, I don't like losing that money, but the risk, it's way behind me now. I'm not going to take a loss on this trade. So this is one of the benefits of trend following, classic Neanderthal generic trend following. Uh, but I'm in the minority because uh, most of the CTA trend followers have, uh, quote unquote, um, advanced in their knowledge. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I call it heresy. You know, I don't like it. Uh, 
And so it just, they take smaller profits. They cut those profits shorter than they should. And there is a bit of a cost to doing that, which uh, we won't be able to get into today. But it's, you know, like they say, um, risk doesn't go away. It just is transferred somewhere. So I have, I'm really protecting that capital. I'm taking these small losses and I'm pushing risk towards where I can afford it in a big profitable trade. And volatility uh, management, volatility targeting, reducing positions based upon increased volatility, that is sort of switching that risk back to your capital. So you're going to have to trade a bit bigger and take bigger losses because your profits are smaller. And, um, but clients see that. You know, they see, my gosh, Jerry, you're so volatile. Um, I really prefer a manager who is scaling back these trades in making less on the big trades because I don't like volatility. So, you know, the turtles always had this attitude of clients are just there to screw you up, you know, just to make you do the wrong thing. <laughs> it sounds like risk managers at the bank too. Like I, I understand completely. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a chip on our shoulder leaving Richard Dennis in Chicago. And uh, I think that that uh, limited our, the size of our business, you know, I don't know if proper, strict, proper trading is a is a good as is as good a business model as listening to clients, making these compromises, um, compromising your your strategy a bit in order to um, make the clients more comfortable and just continue collecting their management fees. And, and do you think that that's what's happening to to many CTAs? They're feeling the pressure from that, and and therefore. The, it, it's almost uh, maximizing uh, returns isn't what they're what they're aiming for. They're actually trying to maximize AUM uh, because the clients aren't able to handle the volatility. Exactly, right. and I think that the, the the CTAs kind of enjoy it as well. It's not like they're not willing participants. They're trying to merge their quant backgrounds, their PhD backgrounds with trend following. And so, yeah, I think it's a problem. Now, this type of uh, taking small profits idea runs counter to our mantra, to our 10 commandments of trend following, but it actually worked pretty well, you know, when there's not big trends. So, and there has been periods where it not only was a risk reduction, it's sold as risk reduction, scientific risk management. But also, heck, you know, if it's a short-term trend that's going to collapse, maybe I'll get out of this thing with some profit because the volatility went up. So I'll take that as well. But now, oh no, now we're into another period. We're back into the, you know, early 2000s and before where we had mega trends, mega outliers, huge profits. So now they're underperforming. Oh, now I remember the reason we let profits run because they can run on a lot further than we've been used to. We thought that the tables have turned a bit and you're just seeing a lot of underperformance by people who really truly don't let their profits run. Now, compared to the original turtles though, you've changed the, your, uh, the number of markets that you trade. And if I'm not mistaken, you also trade it smaller. Like you've, you've dialed down the volatility. Is that correct? Oh, sure. Everybody has, you know, trying to make 15 or 20% now versus the 200. That was a little irresponsible. <laughs> was, that, was that Richard's goal? Was 200 a year? That was what they kind of figured was a, was a decent year? That's their goal. And we had to go with it. You know, that was, it was their money and their rules. And this was how we were raised. We were little young turtles and we were following the rules. I mean, I had a 50% uh, day. I had a negative 50% one day. One one day, yeah. What day was it? Do you remember? I what did. happened? Uh, it was a it was a very very profitable period. The beginning of 1986, there was a lot of good trends. Crude oil um, was one of them. I'm pretty sure. And I went home on Friday, and my bonus was a million dollars. And I was like, ah, I mean, I'm on top of the world. Yeah, I mean, it's just not going to get any better. And then I come in on Monday and it was, you know, all the markets were against us in a big way, but it would probably have been sort of inconsequential if 
if we weren't trading with such high leverage. And so I was up 200%. I finished the day up 160, I think. And I finished the year about 100 plus 170. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the ball was just insane. And how did, you, insane. how did you guys manage? Because if I'm not mistaken, based upon the dates, 1987 was you were still with Richard. I was. And how did, what was that like? And what was the majority of trend followers? Or, and there wasn't really that many trend followers. But what was your group? What were the majority of the positions going into that period? Well, there were some unfortunate positions. Um, I think uh, the most unfortunate was <clears throat> short interest rates. Okay. I don't remember too much more than that. I remember, um, I remember the day very well. I was sitting in my living room watching uh, Money Line, Lou Dobbs Money Line, <laughs> okay. CNN. You know, and so uh, he said bonds finished limit up, and I was like, no, no, they did not. Um, it- they were unchanged. They were like limit down or down a lot on the day, but they finished unchanged. But then I went and looked at my um, quote machine and sure enough, the night session, you know, we stopped trading bonds at three. Right. And so at the night session, bonds were limit up. And um, so, yeah, we were short the bonds. And I remember some friend. I had, I was on the phone with some friends of mine and one of them said, if Euro dollars open up 50, I'm dead. And they opened up 350. <laughs> <gasps> oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then that was the, because the bond market had been trading so poorly up until that point, but did anyone catch the stock market on the, sh- on the short side? Because it, it, or had that flip happened too quickly to get any of the trend followers short? I think we did catch it on the short side, but you know, what's funny is we were so cloistered. We had, we were so in a bubble, which was good because we were being taught how to trade and the bottom line was do the right thing. Follow these rules. Do not worry about losing money. And that's just a great environment to start with and to be encouraged, uh, not based on upon performance. It was based upon are you doing the right trades? It's this uh, uh, unconditional love, unconditional performance. You know, if you did the right trade, you were going to be rewarded irrespective of if you were losing and so we, but we weren't told a lot and I had never heard of flight to quality before. Right. And so I was totally like, oh, you mean if stocks go down, bonds go up? I had not heard of this. So <laughs> we were pretty, we were very good. We were very, um, we were fully equipped to just kick ass, but we weren't that knowledgeable on some things. And, and when... <sighs> Did you? Did anybody have trouble dealing with the large losses as it skidded through and, and and not pulling the trigger, or were all the stops in the market already? Oh no, people had tremendous trouble. I mean, that was the deal. You know, can trading be taught? And we were given the uh, the, the good ideas and the right parameters and systems to trade, but that didn't mean everyone was going to do the trade. Some people froze; they didn't do the trade, or they got out too quickly, or they, you know, just just couldn't handle the pressure. So there was a lot of, uh, just like what you would expect, just because we were handpicked and we were there at the feet of the master uh, with his money being told you're going to be rewarded if you just do the trades like you're supposed to. It was, you know, still was difficult for at some point in time for anyone and everyone to, you know, be really good at following those rules. And out of the 20 people that were in the course, do you have any sense of how many continued in the industry? Not that many, maybe 10 initially. And then it's probably down to like four or five now. Wow. I wouldn't expected that. Okay. One of the things that we talked about um, is obviously the, the discipline to, to take the trade and to take the loss. And that's one of the things that as a trader, I know it's, it's difficult and I've seen many people freeze. And one of the reasons that many retail investors like buying options is because to some extent that money management is taken away from you. If you pay a premium, the most you're going to lose is a premium. And it also has right tail uh, risk in terms of it being able to skew the one way you could lose a little, make a lot. I was wondering, had you ever considered um, farming out some of those duties through the option market? 
I definitely have considered it and researched it and done it and lost a lot of money trying it. Um, but I think maybe, um, as you know, I keep reading and hearing from option experts that buying calls or buying puts, you know, that's not, especially in terms, people talk about it in terms of uh, the S&P and hedging, t- hedging tail risk is not uh, something that's usually very profitable. You have to be very specialized in that regard. So I think trend following, a good way of describing it is option replication, as you mentioned. But I think the reason that it's much easier to trade trend following and make money is we sort of replicate that option without paying the premium. Right. And so much of the option is um, timing of the volatility whereas we don't really have that part in our equation either. Well, and that was going to be my next kind of follow-up question is that as you realize that what your strategy is doing is replicating an option, and to some extent that was the cause of the 1987 crash, all these people trying to replicate an option uh, with portfolio insurance that didn't exist, that they thought that they would just do it and execute the hedges in the marketplace. But um, as you think about that, replicating that option i was wondering if maybe you need to go and ask whether that volatility is cheap or expensive in deciding whether you want to use the option itself as opposed to doing it doing it on your own through hedging if you you understand what i'm saying like if you go do it and Cornval is i don't know what Cornval trades that but let's say it trades at 20 i think it actually trades high so let's say it's 50 and you see that you can do it in the marketplace at 40, maybe there you do it through an option, but if it's trading at 70, you don't bother. That's right. And another thing that happens too is we're so um, dependent and um, we really love these back tests. And it's so easy to do a back test on stocks or futures. And, um, and we kind of can walk away from this back test knowing what we have. Okay. And um, I don't think um, most of the trend followers, or at least the ones that I kind of worked with, are have that same option expertise. Right. And it's just, diff- it's more difficult to actually go back and see if that would have worked through time and, yes. and do it over and over again. Uh, one of the things I've heard you say is you said if a back, t- if a back test said you should volatility target, that you would do it. How, um, how much. How important are those back tests to you? Like in terms of w- would you really uh, like how often are you doing them and 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 are they changing your your strategy on on a day to day basis or is that just for coming up with the original strategy you use the back test when you're coming up with a new idea? Walk us through kind of how you use back tests in your uh, more developed uh, part of your career. I'm not a fan of the back testing. There's too much back testing going on. There's too much believing. Oh, you know, we've we've nailed down the past. The future is going to look similar. So I want to take away from that back test as little as possible. And I've sort of done it in a reverse way. So what I will do is I will look at charts and I will scan through charts and I ask pretty much one question. What's going to keep me in these big trends? There's not a lot of big trends to look at. There's 5 or 10% at best, historically, uh, of big trends. And so I look at those and I say to myself, I put up a breakout or a moving average system, and I just scroll through my Bloomberg and I say, uh, does this parameter keep me in the big trends? And I say, I think so. So then I'll tell my research people, try these parameters and tell me if they work. And they'll say, yeah, they do work. They're, they're good parameters. So then I'm kind of done. I don't want to optimize on all of that data. I kind of want to look at the data. I think this is kind of going to work. It looks sort of reasonable. And they confirm my, um, my ballpark idea. You know, I'm just in the ballpark. I'm not trying to get too precise. I think that's one of the problems with um, managing money and trading is precision. I don't want to be too precise. I tell my sons, don't dig too deep. Don't ask too many questions. Don't be too precise. Because if you do, you won't buy Bitcoin. 
you know, you won't buy uh, the Apple when they, co- I was so negative on the iPhone. I mean, I'm just like, like the world's worst, you know, at, at analysis. And so whenever you hear something that's new and different and um, unusual, don't be skeptical. Put a thousand dollars in it, put a hundred dollars in it, whatever you can afford and see if you don't make a few thousand percent, um, you know, on five or 10%, you may do really well. So I think in trend following, it's the same way. Don't ask too many questions. Don't get too precise. Don't dig too deep. Just have a big portfolio and keep buying those breakouts. And every now and then, you're going to get something that it's unpredictable anyways. No one knows where these markets are going. No one can predict Tesla emissions. The emissions contract made a lot of money. The yen is making a lot of money now. It's totally unknowable. So there's nothing better than just blindly buying and selling these breakouts. You you actually sound like you're more of a disciple than uh, Professor Michael than than we thought. Are are like if you were told tomorrow that you weren't able to trade and that you had to go and sit on the beach somewhere and just uh, enjoy the sunshine and that you weren't allowed to invest in any other trend followers, would there be any other strategies that you think, you know what? That, I think that person can make money doing that strategy, but it just wasn't for me. Like, do you believe that there's other ways that that individuals have figured out how to beat the market? Uh, very good question. You know, I, co- I coined this phrase, not really, I copied it, but I kind of am famous for trend following plus nothing. <laughs> so all of my followers, you know, I'm a cult follower. I'm a cult leader here. All my cult followers, they would be very shocked if I said there was something else. So that one is tough. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I'm hesitant to buy into buy and hold, you know, the 8% return in stocks and a 50 plus percent drawdown. I don't like that idea. I don't know. I have been suckered into um, putting money with very smart people in 2008. Before 2008, I had investments in a lot of famous genius hedge funds yeah. where and I proceeded to lose half my money. <laughs> I'm always saying, you know, that um, machine learning and artificial intelligence, I'm skeptical of that too. I'm so rude uh, <laughs> and closed minded, you know, that um, I think that I could see definitely that if you had this machine learning AI algorithm, that the last piece of code would be, uh, did it make a new high or make a new low? <laughs> so, well, hell, if you put that in there, I think it's going to work just fine. <laughs> I'm in. As long as that's I'm the in. last piece of code. You know, I I always wonder, and I've heard this, and, and maybe I heard it with you when your podcast, but a lot of times the reality is that a lot of this fancy uh, marketing material and, and fancy PhDs are just an excuse for people to to, to surf the waves. The, these hedge funds, they all, the really best of them, let's figure out the Paul Tudor Jones, uh, all these people, most of the time, they're not sitting there buying something because it's so cheap. They're they're going with the trend. Yeah, exactly. I think um, it's, in order to survive in this business, in order to survive on Wall Street, I mean, you got to take small losses. We see it all the time, though, when people don't take small losses or they're not fully diversified. and you know, all the warts that this type of style has, small losses, diversification, longs and shorts, um, it just doesn't go away. You know, these darn trend followers just will not go away. They just, they have drawdowns, they're unappealing, no one likes us, but we're like cockroaches. You cannot kill us. You know, speaking of the big hedge fund managers, isn't it um, Paul Tudor Jones that has the 200 day rule that he basically he won't buy an asset if it's not above its 200 day and he won't sell an asset if it's not below it. Exactly. I I went to a, um, I went to you, there was a hedge fund meeting, um, Julian Robertson, a few tiger cubs and Paul Jones. It was either in 2008 or 2009. So right after the big crash and these tiger cubs were debating Paul Jones and he said he was making fun of them for not paying attention to, um, 200 day moving average and being in gear with the trend. And it was um, John Griffin and Lee Ainsley. And uh, I was there and, and uh, they were 
saying, no, 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 we would not pay attention to this trend and all this sort of stuff. And Julian Robertson said, no, 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 I have to agree with Paul. I think I've changed my mind that uh, this trend stuff and this money management risk control and being on the right side of the trend is a good idea. And I just told my friend, let's leave right now. We got to get up right now and leave. It's not going to get any better ever. You got converted. Julian Robertson being converted. The ultimate value investor is going and and has become a, a disciple of the 200 day. One of the things I've, I've heard you say is that I needed to retrain myself about drawdowns. And I, I'd love to hear about your initial uh, battle with those, those drawdowns. And I'm assuming you mean the drawdowns from the points when you were most profitable. Because uh, the drawdowns from just getting chipped away, although they're bad, they're probably much more easy to handle than those ones where you're up 150% and next thing you're up only 100%. What was that experience like? And, and do you have any suggestions for others that are battling that, that retraining? You, you definitely need to retrain yourself and trade and have methods that work. You know, that's got to be the bottom line. It works. I don't like it, but it works. It really befuddles me why people continue to talk about you just trade something that suits your personality. I just don't get it. I mean, so you want money from the markets and delivered in the way that makes you feel good. Come on, you wouldn't even raise your children. If your children came up with an idea like that, you'd say, what are you talking about? The world is tough. It's hard. You want to sit by the pool all day. This is not how it works. And so you know, one of the questions in the turtle um, 100, you know, the turtle test was a trader should love their losses. And the answer is true. Uh, you know, the losses and the drawdowns, it's part of the system. Love that system. Love it. Love all the characteristics. It's going to make you money. It's going to change your life. So, of course, you love it. Whatever the system has, you love and don't fight it. And so, you're the problem, not the system, not, you know, not uh, if you if you're lucky enough to find ways that work in the market, then um, thank, you know, be thankful for that and try to change yourself to deal with how hard it is to, you know, essentially watch profits turn into losses and watch profits be rare. You know, these big outlier trends, they don't come along that often. And that's a problem. People like smooth returns, low volatility, consistency, all these things we like. But when you do the back test and you do the analysis, the market says, well, if you're willing to trade things that don't have those qualities, you'll make money. <laughs> it's, I was laughing the whole time. Your answer is basically suck it up, Buttertar. You got the markets are tough. Um, <laughs> Jerry, one of the things that I, I like to always ask people is, there, you know, is there a question that I've missed that, that you, if someone that's wanting to learn about trading or wanted to learn about trend following or wanted to learn about Jerry Parker that would have asked that I, that I missed, what would it be? Well, it's kind of a boring in the weeds question, but I think for sophisticated people, they seldom ask the most important question, the allocators, the, you know, the institutions, the consultants, especially as it relates to um, systematic trading and you know, what's your sample size? How many trades do you legitimately have in your back test? What are you relying on? How robust is your system? I've never had anyone be remotely concerned of uh, so many people have these rules and multiple rules, optimizations, trading markets, uh, each market with different parameters, and just digging down into this and saying, why are you confident? How many historical trades are you even looking at um, that you're going to, you know, that that made you decide you wanted to trade this particular set of rules and parameters. And I think that um, it's so rare to hear people, but you know, every day of that turtle program, we were hammered sample size, sample size. And so it's just shocking how, how I never hear some of the most important concepts from other managers, you know, um, and it's just really amazing how, um, you know, you would think you would think that I would be worried about people getting our ideas. Our ideas and the total ideas are all in the public domain, but they're pretty much rejected. And, and do you think that you mean, uh, if I understand this correctly, you're saying that people will just use the last five years instead of the last 50? 
Yes, and then they will build these models with multiple parameters and optimizations. And so um, anything apart from like a one entry rule, one exit rule, and a stop loss rule, you know, you're really getting into a situation where your results are not going to be very robust and your back test has a very low sample size. So it is trying to manage and over-optimize and overfit historical patterns versus, you know, I buy the 100-day high, I sell the 100-day low, and and all hell is going to break loose and it's going to look really ugly, but I'm not going to try to uh, over-optimize and manage those historical patterns. One of the, the one, well, as I was listening to you explain your system before, I, I heard that you had a Tesla, you had a Bitcoin, and I thought to myself, well, that's great. You've added those stocks in hindsight, and they, or not, sorry, I know in hindsight those, those were big winners, but how do you determine at what point you should be adding new potential assets that might be the next breakthrough? And, and, like one of the things that I've thought about is yes, you're managing a lot of money and you're trading this on big liquid markets and you obviously have liquidity constraints, but might this work for the smaller person that's doing it at home? Is there a chance that this works even better on small crappy stocks that you can't trade because you're going to run out of liquidity? Very good question. Very good point. Yes, I agree with all of that. Um, <clears throat> So I think the proper way to choose, now we're talking about systematic trend following here, but the proper way to choose that portfolio is to pay no attention to how well those uh, markets have performed historically. And um, I do that all the time. As I said earlier in our conversation, I've definitely, I definitely continue to trade markets that have not performed well in a long time. I, there may be a couple of markets in my portfolio, Coco for one, that I don't know if it's ever made money since the <laughs> 70s. <laughs> so we're just such a perverse group, uh, just desiring pain and almost doing the opposite of common sense. But no, the portfolio is built with one thing in mind, and that is diversification. So I did uh, some analysis on stocks that were not correlated to the S&P. I got lucky. I'm not, in 2019, I added... Moderna and Tesla. And um, so there was two really big ones, but they were only added because they gave my portfolio increased diversification. And that is what we need to, to uh, concentrate on is we trade the currencies and all the commodities and interest rates and stocks, but we only, they're only in the portfolio because we've determined that they're different. And we are not going to look back historically and say, um, and choose those markets or overweight those markets that have had good trends or good performance. No, no, no. So, not going to do that. So you chose those because they weren't behaving like a regular stock or, or yes. the, 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 the correlation to the regular stock market was low. So theoretically, there must be a whole bunch of other little stocks that could be um, good, but that you just can't be bothered or you can't trade them because they're too small. Is that correct? Like, have you ever looked um, at trying to spread this out? You use 180. Why not, uh, you know, 1,800? <laughs> uh, yeah, infrastructure is an issue, okay. of course. But, uh, you know, one of the things that happened is I did such a great job with uh, diversifying my stock portfolio. And that's just about 25% of my overall portfolio, the stock sector, is that um, during the big run-up, over the past year or so, year and a half, is I really didn't do that well. You know, I had DraftKings, Beyond Meat, Canopy Growth, <laughs> uh, uh, Virgin Galactica, all these weird uh, stocks, and they just started all going down. So I didn't really have a lot of Microsoft and Amazon to make up for it. And um, so I was sitting back there going, good job, Jer, on the diversification thing, but you're kind of sucking wind on the performance. <laughs> And you, again, chose those names because they weren't behaving like Amazon and Microsoft, which would have been more correlated to the S&P. That's right. Right. Okay. And Strictly, strictly speaking. People ask me this question over and over, and then they accuse me of having a special talent for choosing Tesla and uh, Moderna. But I tell them, no, it's the same answer. You just choose these. But CTAs, that's their 
that's what they've done their entire life. They trade all these commodities um, futures because they're different. And so when I got into the stocks, most CTAs don't trade single stocks. For some reason, they just trade these indices, which is kind of silly. But I go in and I can find lots of great diversification, lithium stocks, uranium stocks, rubber stocks. I found a stock the other day. I was so excited. I was so proud of myself. I found this stock. It's the biggest uh, producer of eggs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I said, this is amazing. It's a smaller company, but it only produces eggs. And I bought it and it's just started skyrocketing. So once again, you're a genius. No, I'm not. I want eggs. I don't have eggs. And so um, I think they trade egg futures in China and I don't have access to China. So um, oh, okay. yeah, this is the goal is to diversify this portfolio. And I like the stocks that have a commodity uh, a reason for owning them. And so am I correct to say that the signals that you take for entering into trades are all price based, yet you do use fundamentals, uh, or not fundamentals. Let's just say industries, and 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 you look at more than just price action when it comes to designing which stocks or which assets go into the portfolio. Oh, that's right. I've got to use some analysis <clears throat> to make sure that um, I'm increasing my diversification. Uh, one of the things that I try to do, of course, is uh, try to find a stock that has one, you know, one narrow focus. It's not diversified. I don't want a diversified conglomerate. I'm going to put together, you know, cocoa, coffee, sugar, soybean, Swiss franc, yen, and uh, create my own diversification. But if I can find this one company that all it does is eggs, or all it does is, you know, there's one company out there that all it does is oat milk. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. That's all I want. Uh, so, yeah, the pure, the pure, the strategy, the pure, the focus. I don't want them to diversify, and I think that's what companies do. They start diversifying because they don't want the risk either. So, uh, but you know, that's that limits my ability just to go out and and just grab a bunch of stocks. I have to really do some hard work. Well, Jerry, you've been a real trooper to last as long as you have with us. It's uh, it's getting on on a Friday evening, so I'm going to finish up with our questions. And I, I think we're going to start with your favorite investment book. Uh, that's a good one. You know, I as much as I love Marty Zweig and uh, Winning on Wall Street, um, I think that the best books I've ever read, for my own selfish reasons, were The Market Wizards, one and two. You just can't beat um, un, unfiltered interviews with famous traders, uh, hedge fund guys. And so... I make it a habit to try to track down interviews and podcast when the big, uh, famous, successful people are speaking. So I think those books are, that's where you want to start with those kind of um, market wizards, one and two, Jack Schwager. Uh, you know, for me, it changed my life. Uh, that was, a, I, I'm actually the son of a, of a equity research director and everyone around me traded, you know, moose pasture mines and stuff like that. And I read market wizards and I knew I wanted to be a futures trader. And uh, so it, it's, it's, I completely agree. And you know, one of the things that I find most fascinating about it is as I've gotten older and wiser, I go back and I learn things each and every time when I think, Oh, there's nothing else that I can learn from there. There's a little nuance that I missed before. Cause I wasn't uh, far enough along in my development to catch. That's right. I agree totally. Okay, so the next question is, um, and if there was ever someone that should answer this question, I think it's you. Are great traders born or made? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, I'm going to um, say that, uh, you know, the um, supposedly the turtle program was inspired by trading places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. Oh. I don't think that's true, you know. Uh, but the question for them was, can you train traders? That's a bit different than the question that you asked. Because honestly, I don't know. Is there no trader out there who just has this gift? You know, uh, some of them act like they do. I mean, I mean, they don't talk about systems or rules like uh, Griffin in Chicago. Right. Ken Griffin. He might have a special talent and some of the others, others as well. But can trading be taught? I think. Absolutely. And I think it's safer 
to invest with managers that have a systematic approach. Yes, no doubt. There you go. So they are they are definitely made, not born. Yes. According to you. Okay, now we're going to go with we have two and and questions and they're both kind of fundamental based. So I was worried that you might not be able to answer them because you you know just take the breakouts, but you've assured me you got some answers. So we'll start with the Don Cox question. Don Cox was a famous Canadian strategist who used to say you'd invest on what's on, not on what's on page one today, but what's on page sixteen on the way to page one. Do you have a Don Cox investment or idea for us to consider? I do. I think I think it, this is appropriate to that question, um, and that is that the history of business is better and cheaper. Americans continue to deliver better product and cheaper products, and I think the best product out there is diversified CTA trend following. And so I think the CTAs will dominate and have the vast majority of money. Um, all we need to do is to break this um, situation of where it does look like stocks are superior, they're superior trenders, you can buy the dip, you can make all these mistakes, I think, with proper money management and risk control, and you're going to get rewarded for it. And I think at some point in time, the combining the trend following, risk control, risk management, profit opportunity with um, currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds, long, short, this is such a superior idea and safety uh, for people, and it's going to make uh, investments more consistent and more reliable that I think it, maybe after I retire, of course, <laughs> this will, uh, uh, CTAs will control the majority of the money. It has to happen. Uh, it's a superior product. Well, and I wonder to some extent if it's a function of the fat last 40 years of a bull market and bonds and the great disinflation, putting a tailwind on both bonds and stocks. Uh, you know, it's been tough to compete with that. And if we have a situation where both inflation and interest rates are headed higher, it might be more difficult for them to achieve those rules. And we might see that that is the start of the move towards the CTAs. That's right. People are greedy and they'll just go where the money is. Oh, and so yeah. it's awfully difficult for us to, to convince people and educate people. This is why you should. But then all of a sudden, if we start having great returns compared to the stock market, especially, then they'll miraculously understand exactly what we've been talking about for 30 or 40 years. So, Okay, well, here's, I, I hope, and you let me know when you're going to retire so that I can invest in some CTAs. <laughs> uh, now, in terms of uh, the next great strategist that we like to talk about is Byron Wien. Byron Wien uh, has his top 10 surprises of next year. And when he talks about a surprise, he says something that the market assigns a less than a one-third chance, but they actually has a greater than 50-50 chance of occurring in his mind. Do you have a Byron Wien surprise for next year for us? Well, that's funny. That's a good question. It reminds me of when I first went to uh, working for Rich in uh, probably 1984, he was interviewed in Barron's and they asked him this same question. You're like, what do you think, what is your best ideas for the future? And he proceeded just to go down and talk highly of all the markets that we were all long. <laughs> And I was like, all he's doing is just uh, saying that what's in an uptrend now is likely to continue. So I really can't improve upon that. I do think I wouldn't necessarily be a person who thinks we're in this long-term bull market in commodities necessarily, but I wouldn't um, discount it either. So I think people are probably you know, definitely underestimating um, inflation and the problems. I was a child of the, you know, in the seventies, so I have that to weigh me down and to bias my opinions. But obviously, I think uh, just the whole fact that trends are going to continue is something that people struggle with. So I'm going to go with the commodity trends and um, surprise the right yeah. on the right tail, even from here. Yeah. Okay, I got that, it. That is such a pain in the ass because. You know, we've been long these commodities for so long, and now people are saying, hey, how do I invest in commodities? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my, I just feel so bad for you. But 
you know, I've been wrong for a year and a half. They continue to go up. Right. Okay. And the final question is a young person that's getting into this business. They obviously don't have the luxury of answering Richard Dennis's uh, Wall Street Journal article, but what advice would you give them? You know, I would say prepare yourself, be ready. I was ready. So I had a, an, I had a unsuspecting and uh, certainly didn't deserve all the good fortune I had. But when I got the good fortune, I was ready. And um, in the Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, towards the end, he says, you know, one of the most important things to do uh, to, for your career is to go to cocktail parties in New York City. So in other words, put yourself in a situation where you're ready and when you meet someone who can change your life, a mentor, find a mentor. So you may not find Richard Dennis, and my life would have been probably pretty good regardless, but it's really difficult to achieve uh, something really incredible unless someone takes you under their wing and stay with that person. I think one of the things that was really detrimental to the turtles is we didn't stay there for 10 years or 15 years. It would have been so much better. We'd have been so, we would have been so much better. And so find that mentor, be ready and um, learn all you can. And if it's sweeping the floors or making coffee, be satisfied with that. Uh, that's some great advice. Now, Jerry, you want to take a moment to tell people about Chesapeake and where they can find more information about you and uh, your firm if they're interested? Yeah, chesapeakecapital.com. And um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, easy to find me on Twitter, RJ Parker JR09. And we have a mutual fund, EQCHX. And um, yeah, so it's not hard to find me on Twitter and Clubhouse. You know, I um, I would highly recommend that everyone go and go with it if you're at all interested in trend following or even in the markets in general, go follow Jerry. And I was shocked earlier today. I listened to you and Tom Basso, which uh, was Tom also in the Market Wizards. Or Maybe I, don't I can't remember. remember, or he's been one of those books. Either way, very, very smart fellow. And you, you two were having a discussion on spaces, and I looked at the number of people there, and I said, This is the most underappreciated spaces on Twitter. And I would highly recommend everyone to go and to follow you and listen to your stuff because you were very giving. You spent a, a, an hour and a half talking about very intricate, uh, very sophisticated uh, kind of debate amongst the, the trend falling community about how your strategy was executed. And, and I, and I was just shocked and I was like, Oh wow, this is, this, this should have, you know, 10 times or 20 times as many people listening to, cause it was that good. So make sure you go follow Jerry on Twitter immediately folks. You won't regret it. So thank you again, Jerry. It was a real pleasure having you on our show. Oh wait, no, I can't. I, you know what? I'm sorry. We're going to have to keep going. We got to talk about your fantasy hockey. So our friend, yes. our, our friend Mike is actually, I, I take it you guys are mortal enemies on, uh, uh, in the Fantasy Hockey League? I love Mike, but uh, yeah, we do uh, have a really cutthroat um, attitude towards each other and the whole thing. We have to win. We're, we're poor losers. We're like spoiled. Uh, I, I'm a, he's a spoiled only child. I'm a spoiled oldest child. I had three sisters. I was the oldest. So yeah, we have to have our way. We're not going to be happy. Uh, and so my way is um, long term, right? I'm long term. So I look at a year or two's worth of data of some of these players. I'm not going to be influenced by the last 30 days. But uh, last year, Mike's father, who's also in the league, who Mike lost to, loses to frequently as well, he did the opposite approach, which was a short term strategy of looking at the, the past 30 or 40 days of trade of the players performance so he was more of a and we both finished in the top two so um so you were a long-term trend follower buying the 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 long-term one and if i understand this correctly you were actually buying weakness of people that were lo in long-term uptrends but had yes. but had been in a 30-day decline and when i heard that i thought to myself that doesn't sound quite as, as pure a trend follower as 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 he might as, as he might make out no, no, no. It's very, very much uh, trend following because, um, you know, uh, I have these uh, positions on that I've had on for a year or two 
And they frequently uh, have uh, sell-offs that last for a month or two. They just don't kick me out. So okay. then they go right back to the highs. So, you know. Um, so you were, are, were uh, it, it, now, uh, it's a question about uh, the, the fantasy hockey, but it also c- pertains to your trading. Will you buy and add to a trend that you've already entered into? In both no. hockey and in, in, in your real positions. Oh, in hockey, I guess I am. Yes. Because I missed the I missed the initial entry. You know, someone else grabbed this player off the, oh, uh, okay. the draft before I did. And so they want to get rid of a guy who has two years of wonderful performance. And I am like, no, 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 I'll take that. That's still in an uptrend. Uh, so I get it. Okay. It's a little bit modified with the trading. But I was just going to say that the lesson here is, whether it's long-term or short-term, stick to what you believe and don't give in, don't give up. And so that was the lesson that I learned in the hockey. It's definitely part of trading is, um, you know, convince yourself that your strategy is still okay and, you know, have a long-term point of view. So are you able to, to trade your hockey players with the same emotional detachment that you do with your positions, meaning, or is there like you don't have a kind of a soft spot for one team or one player? Is it purely That's by true. the numbers? I don't. I don't because I'm a huge Tampa fan. Yeah. And I live in Tampa and I love the lightning. I could never leave Tampa strictly because of the lightning. And uh, I have no lightning players on my team. Okay. So. <laughs> so you are hardcore. <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> okay. The other night I was at a game and we were down one to nothing. And I told my wife, we're, th- you know, the bad news is we're down one to nothing. The good news is that was my player who scored against us. <laughs> <laughs> you were hedged. You were all hedged up. Totally hedged. Anyway, totally. thanks again. It was a real pleasure. And thank you for your time, Jerry. Thanks, Kevin. It was great. All right, Patrick, time for talking charts. All right. Well, listen, it's been uh, two weeks. So the, um, the previous last week's um, or the uh, two weeks ago when we did the top things to watch, we'll just quickly say what they are, but they're a little stale. So we'll just get through them. But we were um, looking at uh, the turn point for China stocks. It was certainly a low um, and they've been progressing somewhat higher. Was it a buy on dip on commodities? Somewhat. Yeah. But uh, they've really been more grinding sideways in the last couple of weeks. But uh, the num- number one was the bottom in for tech. And while uh, it's it's a, a tale of different types of tech. Certainly, some of the Fang stocks have really just been ripping in those last two weeks. But uh, you know, while Arc and others have really bounced, uh, it's not that impressive on all the tech. So it's a, it's really uh, you don't want to basket them all in the same story. But uh, we can look at some of the charts in a little bit. But Kev, let's talk about the top three things to watch next week. And uh, really, I just wanted to more broadly uh, ask the question of what's next for these equity markets. Uh, uh, Like we went through an epic uh, 500 S&P point run to the upside uh, in a span of just several weeks. And um, and as that run, uh, run happened, there it was like twelve percent run, uh, uh, just a huge push. Uh, it drove all markets, global markets, Euro stock, Nikkei, everything just was ripping higher. And uh, and uh, when you look at the past, many of the past rallies in the S and P five hundred, at least initially, started to stall out after about a five hundred point advance. Not that they changed trend, but simply pause the advance. And we already saw a little bit of a, a pullback here. Uh, the, uh, so the bigger question is, uh, wh- how does this sequence play out? Is has th- Have things decisively turned bullish? Is this just a matter of now switching back to buying all dips uh, on, on these markets? And, you know, it's imminent that the S&P is going to be at 4,800 within a month? Uh, or uh, is this uh, just too much too quickly and, uh, and we're going to just be grinding sideways here? with a, a Fed call up above. Uh, do you have any insight on what you're thinking? Well, I've been saying for a while this year is going to be the year that it frustrates both the bulls and bears, Patrick. And it just when it seemed like the bears were getting uh, all exuberant and it was going to finally crack, we got this big rally out of nowhere and we've, uh, we, you know, as you have highlighted, exploded higher. But um, I'd be careful because I don't think it's going to be this onward and upward. It's... Uh, the environment has changed and uh, stocks don't go just don't stocks don't trend as much as everyone thinks they do. 
Right. And so uh, number two was, uh, is the bond carnage over? Let's just pick on the um, uh, 10 year bond. And obviously, uh, I, I'm about to, uh, to concede of losing a stake to you uh, when we get to the um, uh, skin in the game. But because uh, the selling did continue over the last couple of weeks. But uh, the, the key thing here is, is that uh, the, all the Treasury bonds have j it's just been a bloodbath, not just by uh, the, the size of the move, but the rate of change. The, the, it was literally one of the steepest drops that we have seen in years um, on the downside of these bonds. It was just an out downside rip. Got a few days of bouncing, but it really feels almost like they're rolling right over again. And uh, are we, is that enough selling on the short term? Look, I know that you are uh, a mega bond bear in the bigger picture, right? And I'm sure that uh, you're going to make your case why over the next year or two yields can be much higher. But we're talking about just this particular move. And like, has it, has it maybe gone too far too much and, and uh, things are going to kind of stabilize and mean revert here? Or do you think it's just going to keep going? I think the front end of the bond market is very close to having a, a, a let's say the most hawkish Fed that's going to actually occur priced in, Patrick. So I'd be careful about assuming that the two years is going to get significantly. Yeah, here's the two year, just like it's so ugly, right? Yeah. And having and like said that, uh, having said that, I, I, you know, Patrick, the the long end is actually trading pretty well considering what's happening to the short end, and that's what's happening the, with the yield curve flattening. So if we get a situation where oh. the Bond market are you, starts. Are you suggesting a steepener, sir? Well, you know me; I'm always <laughs> wrong, long and wrong that thing. Um, but uh, if we got a situation where the market didn't think that the Fed's rate hikes were going to cause an immediate crash of the economy, the potential for the long end of the bond market to get hammered is way higher than people think. Way higher, even with this terrible performance that we've had so far, it could get a lot uglier. Like look at look at this five uh, thirties uh, now decisively negative, uh, and uh, and we have an inverted five thirties, uh, and and then the question that I'm sure all listeners uh, are is how long and wrong are you the five thirties? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, th there's a lot of different trades that I have, Patrick. But uh, I, don't forget, I was the biggest bond bear around. So, yeah. So, you're you're uh, making money elsewhere, right? Right. And the thing about it is that, uh, you know, I wrote I'm this just, article. I'm just poking I, at you. I know like, you are. I know you are. I, but I do remember I, I wrote an article in early January that was picked up by Bloomberg. And, and, and everyone told me, I said something that said the bond market is refusing to accept economic reality. And everyone told me what an idiot I was for not understanding that bonds mature at par, or bonds have convexity, all these different things. And yet, meanwhile, look at this. We just had one of the worst returns ever in terms of the first quarter returns in the bond market. Yeah, it's been an absolute, as you mentioned, it's been being, an absolute Being a 60-40 uh, portfolio manager is, uh, has been a rough ride here. And, and, and I, I, I believe that the, this is not going to get any better. And I, I do find it funny, though, Patrick, one of the things that I think is most ironic is the fact that the people that were most uh, vocal in telling me how the bond market is, is don't fight the bond market, all this stuff, they seem to be the ones that are telling me now that the Fed's going to raise by the most amount, that they're going really? to they're going to cause this. And and I, I really think there's still an accident to be had if the if the if the economy doesn't behave like uh, the the bond market is expecting because the bond market is is expecting the fed to raise i don't know 250 basis points or whatever it is and then for the for the whole economy to roll over and what if the fed doesn't raise as quickly as they expected or what if the even worse what if the economy doesn't roll over like everyone thought what if it continues to be strong even in the face of this yeah so, but kev uh, okay again i think that you're you're kind of crossing streams in terms of time frames uh like i think a lot of those things you're saying are things that certainly can continue to manifest over the next year or two but let's be realistic 
this has been a little too much too quick. And often markets, uh, when everyone is getting all confident in a trade that is working so well, often eats it on a mean reverting uh, snapback the other way. That yeah, run, I, I actually don't think stuff. that a lot of people are, are short the long end of the bond market. In fact, I think most people are playing the, the long end from the really? long side. Really? Yeah. Mm, I actually, yeah. you know, maybe we'll have the... the uh, well, the makings well, of we another bet. bet. The makings well, of another bet. We just, I just lost a stake to you on the freaking bond. But you're gonna double down yeah, on I the, might. Oh I my might. god! All you right, all right, all right. I'm, it, I'm so. ready. I'm ready okay. for it. Let's do it. Anyway, so number one, we were watching the FOMC uh, meeting minutes that are coming out next week. Uh, any thoughts on what, uh, what you think can happen? It will be an interesting one, Patrick, because don't forget the the Wall Street thinks that the Fed has become really hawkish, and it'll be interesting to see. And yes, there are a couple of members Bullard has been saying some crazy shit lately, and one doesn't Bullard say crazy shit, but it's especially Bullardtastic <laughs> even for him. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the real debate was behind the scenes. And the other thing is, we we haven't talked about this a lot because the market's so focused on rates. What about quantitative tightening? And why, why if, if the Fed is as concerned as they are about inflation, why aren't they just hammering it with like a more aggressive quantitative tightening? And I know the answer. The answer is that they don't want the quantitative tightening to be a policy tool. They just want it to be unwound in an orderly manner. But if you, what you're really trying to accomplish is raising rates and changing financial conditions, because that's one of the things that they seem to be targeting, then it seems to me that increasing the pace of quantitative tightening might be a way to go. And it'll be interesting to see if there's any hints of that in the Fed FOMC minutes. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk some charts. All right. Okay. Uh, the um, first thing I want to highlight. Okay. So S and P legitimate five hundred point rally, twelve percent. Great run on the upside. The Nasdaq also got a bounce, but overall, I have to say that relative to the magnitude of the drop. Uh, the S&P has outperformed the NASDAQ uh, in terms of recovering uh, the, uh, its amount of losses off of the top. And um, the NASDAQ, while it has bounced, and certainly I don't want to you know, say that when you tack 2,000 points on the uh, NASDAQ in a, a couple of weeks, it's not, a, uh, it's not chump change, uh, but a little bit weaker. But no one's even been weaker than that. The Russell. Oh. And what's, am what's amazing to me about the Russell here is okay so the russell uh, during the february carnage didn't make lower lows and often that draws attention to from a lot of investors and traders as there's a momentum shift and that the selling isn't focused on those small caps uh, but what's uh, pretty interesting is that well, over the last two weeks when there was these ripping i guess that you have to think that might have uh, be just further evidence of just the magnitude of of um, uh, things like uh, option uh, gamma and all these different things that come into play with dealers uh, where in it's not as relevant in the russell as it is in the s p uh do you think that that could have been a contributor to that? but one way or another uh, yeah 100 percent, patrick i think that the s p was more games than we think in terms of the charm, which is the effect of time, in terms of those dealers having to buy back stuff, the S and P whale, the J P Morgan S P X uh, option whale was more interesting this year, this uh, quarter because of the of where the strikes were ended up being. I think that there was a huge amount of charm, and the other thing that I'll put out there, Patrick, is that with all of the uncertainty in the with the Ukrainian Russian war, if you think about it from a uh, global macro uh, perspective, if you're a portfolio manager, where do you hide? You don't go and hide in, in small in caps. The higher beta small cap, yeah. No, you go buy the biggest, the best quality. Hey, so why don't we buy some utilities? We'll talk about that. Chart okay. In a moment. <laughs> but, but I think that that, so I, so to me, the fact that the S and P was the leading index uh, in this last, you know, couple of weeks is a function of two things. One, the option. I think that is the main thing. The 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 fact that it's it is the as Jim Carson told us, it is the risk management tool for everyone in terms of using the options. So if there's going to be distortions based upon options, that's where it's going to occur. And then two is the fact that it had a quality bid. 
Well, what if that then means that we could use the Russell as a pure understanding of what is actually really happening in the underpinning equity flows? I, I would agree with that. I would say that the Russell is reflecting uh, investors' expectations about the U.S. Uh, markets much better than the S&P. Right. So like when you look at this bigger picture chart, zooming out a little bit, uh, obviously there's that infamous prairie dog that occurred uh, back in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and it was a textbook. It is the one that we're going to put in when we make the the, uh, market huddle dictionary and we put all of our our, our, – we explain to me, everyone, what the actual pictures look like. This is what we're going to put. All right. But the interesting part to me, in technical analysis, one of the things that we always look to observe is that where previous, what was previous support becomes overhead resistance, um, uh, that uh, is a, a very clear um, depiction of, uh, of a trend being established, in this case, to the downside. And so the fact that the Russell is struggling to um, uh, along what was a major support for over a course of a year uh, is uh, potentially a warning sign that there's more downside coming to the Russell, uh, or at least it's just demonstrating how very weak it is in yeah. this environment. Right? And it, it got rejected like, uh, you know that? Did you ever see that ad of the the basketball player when the when they said I can't cover this guy and he's naked? <laughs> you ever seen it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> that that that's how bad they got rejected when that guy came at you and tried to you know push through the middle and everyone was just like okay. <laughs> All right, let's let's go on because uh, I don't want to have any more of those images in my mind. Uh, the um, uh, interesting. Google it, folks. It is a no, no. Don't ad. do not. No, Google it's a good it. ad. It's all, it's all it's all grayed out. You can't see right. anything. All right. So the uh, the VIX. Um, I, you know what? I can't help but to feel that it's an opportunity. Like, okay, so no, no. But here's my here's my issue. Okay, <laughs> Here we go. For, okay. VIX is down. So I could make a, no, no, like stop, a computer stop, program. Stop for a if VIX equals down or lower than 15, Patrick equals bullish. No, no, no stop for a second because <laughs> I actually am not buying VIX products and betting on the VIX going higher. What I am, though, saying is that in a, in a period where we have monetary tightening and a lot of uncertainty in the stock market, the fact that they make volatility cheap enough that you can use options as a way to now reasonably priced options to be able to, uh, to play your directional bets without overpaying uh, a vol premium means that you can benefit from the convexity and optionality of options uh, at a reasonable price. I personally think down here, utilizing options just makes a whole lot of sense well it's true if it's cheaper it should be better and i guess from that perspective it it it, all of a sudden all insurance has become on sale so from that perspective it's great from the people that are just perpetually buying vix expecting the world to end it's just Uh, you're just gonna you're you're just gonna keep eating uh the vol right yeah well the the carry and then 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 not only that the vxx debacle with Barclays selling too many and it's just that thing's now oh, yeah. six dollars overpriced or whatever. It's 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 a shit show. Although I do believe Patrick that there's a new double uh, VIX out there. I think UVIX. So if you want to go, remember, wasn't yeah. that the the UVXY? Wasn't that the thing that blew everyone up? What was the one? Yeah, that, no. yeah. Why not? Like, let's bring them all back. Let's like, bring you them know back. What? Let's let's bring them back because there, I can't think of a time when it's more appropriate to get retail investors going double and triple exposure on this shit. Uh, yeah, because you one, know what? One if time was, exposure if is ever, not enough volatility. Yeah, you know what? If there was ever an instrument that needed double exposure because it wasn't volatile enough, it's the. <laughs> All right. So uh, I wanted to first just quickly highlight one thing on the dollar without going into too much detail, without uh, making you roll your eyes. But generally, the overall uptrend remains somewhat intact. Obviously, it's been far more of a a choppy sideways period, but it's very hard to argue that there's a downtrend in the dollar. The prevailing uptrend remains somewhat dominant. Agreed. And, And so 
what I wanted to highlight there is this chart going over the last year and a half of the emerging markets over the S&P, uh, looking at the factor there. And uh, S&P has just massively outperformed emerging markets uh, in this period. And, and the dollar has been... And the dollar has been a huge headwind for this. And one of the, I'm certainly not interested in being bold enough to make a call that somehow this is a turn point. But I, I continue to think that, that when we finally see this trend shift, that this is going to be a, a compelling opportunity. And I wonder whether this year we're going to see the signal that, that um, it causes that rotation or whether we have to wait a little bit longer out uh, in order to see that a, a new prevailing trend uh, come in. Are you all ready uh, with a bias that this is going to... Uh, like, you know, I know me. I am always have a bias so that the emerging market... Over the can... long term, I over the long term, uh, emerging markets should outperform the S&P. Now, the, uh, yeah. one thing I will say, Patrick, that I'll push, but is that you've chosen the EEM, and I don't, I can't remember what percentage China is. But China is, yeah. That's way too much. And yeah. the one thing that I've done is I, I, I almost don't even want Asian emerging markets. I want to go buy all the South American, and, so, you know, things like, like yeah. that. And so I'm wondering if, you know, in the just past, basket Brazil and uh, yeah. India in one basket. I'm, yeah, point. I'm wondering if in the past that we've gone and we've put them into emerging markets into one group, and that that those days should be gone, and we should be speaking a little more care and yeah, but but, but any, anyone can make their own little basket. The beautiful thing with the iShares, they have the individual country ones, so you know you can turn around and just cherry pick your favorite um, emerging market countries directly and and make your own little basket, right? Yeah, I do. Anyway. I did see some, by the way, some like I think Goldman Sachs is getting bullish on China. There's some people that are saying that. Or let's talk about the China chart here for okay. a second. Um, you know, obviously, uh, um, Xi Jinping came out and uh, and really created uh, a short term catalyst. Now, um, on the short term, we we got that big reversal candle that uh, on the news, and um, and overall, it didn't make a lower low. It was a nice classic flagging formation, trying to break out of a multi week high. Um, it's approaching, if I can use a really thick crayon here, uh, uh, the the upper trend line uh, of a potential tr uh, trend shift, but it does have all of the echoes of the Russell, which is, you know, it, it it's while it's bouncing, there is some substantial overhead resistance coming and it is very, very premature to already be calling a major trend change. It was a ridiculously oversold market. Um, and it was due for a bounce, and uh, and the Chinese government just gave a catalyst to to stop the selling. But uh, to already be outright bullish, it is way too early. It's a pretty ballsy call, to be honest, uh, to be outright bullish at this moment yet. You know, I, I maybe in the second half of the year or going into the fourth quarter, maybe there'll be the right conditions for a more, a more meaningful turn. Uh, but I think it's too early. Patrick, I think that was some of your best technical analysis work that I've ever heard. Oh Jesus! Okay. I do. All right. I'm not. I'm not even being like. Usually, I'm giving you a hard time, and I'm being sarcastic. I like that, and and I right. and I do and I do agree, which means it probably is headed gonna straight be up. It's going to keep it. Um, <laughs> and it, it does seem to have overtones of the IWM chart. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The um uh, the other thing I want to highlight: crude oil. Uh, obviously, you, you've been a little bit cautious about crude on the short term that it kind of got a little too far too, uh, too quickly. Uh, but the, to me, uh, that uh, 100 handle, that, it was really more about 104, 105. 100 is a nice clean round number. Uh, like I really, in order for the short term bull run to have the window stay open to the upside where we could have seen a run to 130, 140, 150 on the interim, they really needed to hold the line. And the fact that we're seeing just uh, it lose the momentum uh, 
means that we may see a um, an extended consolidation phase before the next bull phase starts. I'm not in any way bigger picture bearish. Simply, the bigger question was on the short term, as in the next three to six weeks, is there an imminent move to those upper targets or is it more of a, a June, July, August, or maybe even a, you know, a th late third quarter story and for it to start going higher again. One way or another, yeah, it's it, it's disappointing price action, and it's increasing the likelihood that uh, this consolidation is just going to keep grinding here. Patrick, what scares me about oil, and I don't know if I've said it out here, but you get on Twitter spaces, and, the, and all the spaces are all, is oil going to 200 or 300? And whenever I see that sort of exuberance, I feel like we need to get uh, shake out some of that bullishness and I'll feel better when I get to see some Twitter spaces about people worried about am I overextended on the long side yeah, of yeah. Twitter. By the way, by the way, this is a little piece of anecdotal evidence for you. Uh, we, we'll talk about my concussion that I have, but uh, my <laughs> concussion doctor, I hope he's not listening. He probably is not. Let's face it. He probably never made it this long even. So... When I got there and I'm, you know, going through and he's asking what I do, he then told me that he he likes to dabble in a little trading himself. <laughs> and uh, guess what? He's long. It's not Tesla. It's not Bitcoin. Exxon Mobil. It's it's oil. But uh, oil uh, futures? Or, I don't or know. He's long energy? oil. I think it's oil and oil stocks. Point yeah. Is, I, I, the point like, is the moment, that's like the just, moment my brother-in-law uh, loaded up on, on Exxon, I was like, holy shit. That was done. it. That was it. Yeah. Like, you know what? Like when when you when you know that uh, uh, yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's froth. It's yeah. frothy. All right. Let's move on before I get myself in trouble. A uh, little disappointing that copper can't get any traction. You know what, the copper stocks and a lot of the resource stocks continue to get healthy money flow. And this is actually the interesting part. Let's actually have a quick conversation about this, right? Oil pulled back, right? But let, take um, XOP, the, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, oil and gas exploration ETF, about to make a 52-week high. It uh, didn't get the memo, Kev. Yeah, that, uh, but to be that, fair, the stocks are no, actually no. better value okay. than the actual Okay, no, no, but just because let's we just could have commodity go nowhere for so, like sit here at 100 bucks so let me companies. just work the theme first okay right? so sir. copper hasn't been able to uh, to run but you take the copex 52 week high you take gold um you know like you, you here let me just pull up the gold future here you know gold's been grinding it down sideways gdx was uh, uh, almost at a 52 week high what's happening is there's this money flow into resource stocks and it's going right across the board it doesn't matter which one of these things are people are buying up resource stocks there's some sort of big buyer coming in maybe retail is just hot on this stuff but the commodities are not uh, like normally you know you see that correlation between commodities and commodity stocks not just energy but all of these and what we're seeing is all of the underlying commodities all took a break and the commodity stocks themselves have not actually got the memo. And now the question is, which one is right or wrong? Maybe these commodity stocks are just actually signaling that the commodities will just catch up. Or maybe, maybe they're uh, both maybe right, the Patrick. You could have oil going down to even, you know, sideways to down and the commodity in the oil stocks going up. They're cheap. Okay, but you're, you're only looking at oil, but the other resource stocks yeah. have been, uh, it's uh, like I'm talking right across the okay, board. Okay, so and I, this. Patrick, I will agree with you that um, it's not normal. Let's just, let's agree on this. It's not, n normally the correlation is, is that when one moves, the other tends to have uh, an, an influence in that direction of the underlying. Right. And so uh, well, this and, is what I will say to you, Patrick, that the commodity stocks as a percentage of the market capitalization of the entire stock market are very low. And if big, huge whales huge allocators, yeah, are change in. even a slightest bit, it won't matter what happens to the commodities. The commodity stocks will go higher. That's interesting. And, That's I, interesting and it's funny it. that you say that because you're probably correct. I've been talking to you guys about this for a while. They said, you know, if the big boys come for it and, and gals, 
then there's it won't matter what the price of the commodity does. And I yeah, and I yeah. suspect that maybe what you're noticing is because I've been haven't been watching the market as much as I should have been. Uh, maybe it's occurring right now as I speak. All right. So the um, uh, in anyway, it, I just thought it was really interesting to see that kind of uh, divergent there. Uh, what I wanted to highlight: it's interesting to see which sectors uh, are kind of dogging it in uh, in the um, uh, broader U.S. equity markets. What's interesting is while the financials themselves have uh, kind of been wishy-washy, very S&P kind of uh, um, market. The, the, those regional banks look uh, very much more like the small caps, and they are obviously more in that kind of a basket, but um, they seem very heavy uh, and can't seem to get um, any r- uh, real traction. Well, the financials in general are trading like crap. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, let's be realistic. The S and P rallied. Sorry, when the S and P rallied, yeah, but, uh, but ten percent off the lows. The um, but they look, get dragged the along. XL, no, Patrick, well, but they get saying, the they X- get dragged along with that trade. All I'm that we saying is about. the XL, um, the XLF yep. has really just traded in line with the S and P. It was a twelve percent rally in in the S and P. It was a twelve percent rally in the XLF. The, you know what? They're, I wouldn't say that the XLF is dogging. They are actually it's actually beta one to the index at this moment. But the but the small ca- sorry the regional banks have been dogging it and that's an observation. Uh, I, I I even dabbled with the retailers and and it certainly hasn't been working. Uh, but like the retailers have just been uh, getting pummeled throughout this period. I've been toying with like are we going to see a bottom in these biotechs? But they continue to just drag their heels and don't want to see to put together. But and then there's that. Uh, I don't know uh, if you know anyone that's been uh, trying to talk up those home builders. Oh, yeah. But, uh, Anybody along uh, that's an idiot. <laughs> looks like God. It looks like death. It, like they, they're just getting pummeled, right? And so the, it's interesting uh, to kind of ask what's working. And you know what is working? What? Utilities. What the? I'm not even going to swear. But like this. Yeah, like, this is a family show. We never swear. Yeah, fuck. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but like, listen, this this is insane to me. The, okay, now I get it. All right, like you can have like your, uh, you know, some hedge eye guys come on and play quads and all this other stuff. No, and but talk it, about yeah. These but let, let's let's be let's be realistic. The bond market had its face ripped off, and there has been one general thing that has worked over time is is that interest rate sensitive sectors. Now, such as the bond proxy sectors that pay large dividends or carry very large amounts of debt on their balance sheets and therefore what, what they can finance at influences it. Typically, utilities are sensitive to bonds and they yeah. tend to correlate. And the fact that we're seeing a bond collapse and the utilities are running like, uh, uh, you know, is, I know that we're going to see electrification of the world. And I guess some of these electric utilities are going to, uh, to, to maybe uh, see expansion and things like that. But this is nuts. OK, so I, I agree. But usually when there's something like this, Patrick, that's nuts, we're missing something. So, folks, wow, we've- whoever knows why this is. And we don't need guesses because Patrick and I do all the guessing already for most of the time. But someone who actually knows what's driving this, tweet it out, send us an email. We'd love to hear it. I'll suspect right. there's a I'll suspect there's a story we're missing, Patrick. That's right. what Probably I suspect. Is. You know, and if want, someone wants to let me know, I'd love to hear it. Okay. All right. Anyway, let's leave it at that for talking charts. So let's let's go on. Kev, S- skin in the game. I finally won a staker. Actually, oh. I won stakers before because we had. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of moose though, buddy. So we're 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 gonna you eat all the moose. Gonna, yeah, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to switch over to some wagyu it's, it's or. Really, uh, or really uh, di- no, I want the moose, man. That's really disappointing. No. You didn't save any for me. Could have no. said Kev needs to have the moose. Yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. Well, why don't you tell people the bet that I won first of all? All right, all right. so let's uh, let's get that. So we were betting on that um, last week on the T bond. It was two weeks ago. We were, it was, uh, but we settled that one week ago. It's just you weren't on last week. But uh, we were just doing an over under on that long bond at the um, 
Uh, it was 152.15. And uh, I was over. You were under. And I didn't even have a chance. It okay. just kept going. So let and, me tell every. So, oh, sorry, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt. But let me tell everyone about Skin in the Game. It's our weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager. And the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by the next episode. And the currency for the wagers is as follows. A Duke and Duke, although we're calling it, uh, what is it, um, Bob, uh, McKenzie and McKenzie. A pint of beer, a burger bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, which is a 2-4, a bottle of wine, or a steak dinner. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. All wagers settle in full, and there will be no netting in positions. Now, Patrick, I've been thinking about this. And I'm scared. in honor scared. of Jerry okay, and the trend followers. All right. And having just letting your profits keep going. Okay. I'm doing it again. Oh, June no. T bond future, up or down from here, you pick it. And I'm assuming based on your talk that you're gonna pick up. Jeez. Oh, so we're gonna go all right, so we're going to the ZBs, right? Yep. Uh, and we're gonna grab that June contract. Jerry'd be so proud of me. <sighs> okay. So we're at one forty nine. 26. All right. I'm going to go up. Nice. But I'm not doing another steak. <laughs> okay. You name a it. Case Any, of beer? Anything below a steak, I'll do. I'm fine with it. Case of beer. Okay. You're done. All right. So this is going to be the most expensive. Oh, my God. Anyway, <laughs> let's. All right. Once again, so uh, it makes it easy for Lena because she doesn't even have to update anything. <laughs> That's right. She can change, just like change uh, the price. it's the same thing. Just changes the price on the bet. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so the bet is on. Okay, Lena, hop on here and save us, or it's time for no stupid questions. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll see who wins next week. All right. But I hope I get both sides. <laughs> um, first question here. Hello from Minneapolis, home to. Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Is that what I said? Did I say that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully he can remember this is his squash I'm actually Polistin. having trouble with words. I'm stu stutter stuttering a little bit and stuff like that. So <laughs> definitely them. It's not the beer it's this time. It's not the beer this time. My doc, my, my, my oil loving concussion doc has told me no beer. Anyways, we'll talk about that later. Right. Let's keep going. Okay, so my question is about upward price action over a several-day period in a single equity with falling volume. Is this a bearish immediate-term trading signal that a reversal is due? During Where's the Trade this week, we looked at INDA, India ETF, and it looks like volume is not supportive of its upward price action. Thanks for the show and all the good teaching. Glad to have the dynamic duo slash trio back in action. Nice. Cheers. Nice. Uh, okay, Kev, may I? Uh, well... Just, um, well, first of all, uh, listen, I don't want to say volume isn't important. Volume uh, is always a consideration um, when observing the, the, the behavior of markets. Uh, but uh, when a prevailing trend is set underway, uh, sometimes uh, I, as a move starts getting exhausted uh, and volatility ranges narrow, uh, a lot of the active traders are not triggered to be buying and selling actively. And generally, it causes volumes to uh, intraday volumes to just kind of back off. And I uh, caution to uh, not overread into that, particularly in trying to make a call of some sort like it's imminently bearish on the intermediate term or something like that. Volume uh, should be a consideration, but I, I think that um, that alone is not um, enough. The second thing is when talking about uh, India ETF, something like the INDA, um, you want to realize that it's based off uh, the underlying index itself, which uh, is uh, is driving that move, and the ETF is not going to give you the information in terms of how the underlying India market volumes are when you're looking at the volumes of the ETF. So it's it, it's it's just not enough depth to even be able to read into it. So I wouldn't overread into that. Is that enough, Kev? Do you have yeah, I know that that's one's all up your alley, so it's perfect. All right. All right, so uh, let's do the next one here. Second question. Hey, everyone. Enjoy the recent shows. Keep up the good work. One of these days, I'll have some side effects for you. But this listener didn't have oh, one. Oh, um, fail. <laughs> 
My question today is what a trader actually does all day. I get what retail day traders like Michigan Gandalf do. I get what market makers do. But the way both Kevin and Patrick talk about trading, they're often putting on longer term positions. Do you guys just research and watch these positions every day? Or are you making trades every day to capture whatever opportunity you see in the market that day? Well, I guess that's a very personal question on that. <laughs> personal. Uh, <laughs> well, no, because every trader is different. You know what? Okay, Kev, I always say, like, I've had the opportunity to to speak in front of and, uh, and train, you know, tens of thousands of traders, and I have never met two traders that trade the same. I, I just never have. Everyone is as unique as the fingerprint. I, my members are probably sick of he, me using that example, but uh, every trader has a unique version. So uh, obviously, this is just a personal thing in terms of yeah. how do we approach investing and trading. Um, and what I find is that when I stare too much actively at the charts perpetually, if uh, sometimes it uh, forces me to. Uh, over trade and make um, a bigger deal about a short term move that is not as meaningful. Um, I tend to try to uh, step back and make sure I'm, I see those uh, trends that I want to be a part of. And I find that if I overanalyze the intraday price action, if it makes me lose my anchor of, of what of the core themes that I have and what I want to see. So I try generally to build themes and try to watch key levels on the market that signify that maybe I'm wrong or, or that the trend is working in my favor and I should to continue to press it um, and uh, and try not to to overanalyze the intraday squiggles. Is there anything that you do different? Well, I trade a lot of things that I don't talk about. Is the reality, and I do trade some things like Michigan uh, Gandalf or whatever is uh, horse lover fat horse fat lover. That's it, right? Horse f fat lover. Um, so I do trade things, banging stuff back and forth. I also trade illiquid situations that don't uh, that I couldn't talk about because they're too they're too illiquid. And if I started telling people about it, it would move the stock and or the bond or whatever. I do arbitrage. I'm also trying to research different things. I'm working on my computer programming. So there's a lot more for me than just what you see in terms of my trading. And one of the things that I would just say is that whatever you do, just try to always get better and, and work on figuring out the next thing. Because the moment that you start to you know, rest on your laurels and you think that this is going to be uh, easy and that you're not, um, uh, you don't have to do any work, the market's going to take it away from you and the next thing's going to happen without you. So just whatever you do, whatever you choose to do, just keep working at it and be diligent. All right. Uh, oh, and by yeah. the way, the other thing I love to do, uh, for those that know me well, I love car chases. <laughs> so, it, so if there's ever like, often it's in L.A. If you ever see one, <laughs> why please, do? You, why is it only in L.A.? It's that awesome, though. I don't care why it is. It's awesome. I saw one the other day with a woman they were going after that looked a lot like Cindy uh, or like um, what's the what's the woman that I love? Uh, the, Lindsay. 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 Oh, there Lohan. we go. Um, so I saw that uh, there was one the other day that looked like Lindsay Lohan. And there was a little concern that it actually might be her. Um, so if you see one, please pass it along because I love them and they're they're great. I figured out, by the way, just so you know, the easiest way to get out of them is you got to drive it into like a shopping mall parking lot. Why is that? Because then they get in there and then the tr and then the helicopter can't get them. There's like, I think it's the Sherman Oaks one or whatever. There's one that I've seen a couple of them do. Anyways, it's fascinating stuff. Oh. So, and then there's obviously, we haven't, you know, someday we should talk about this, but the llama, there's these two llamas that got away in <laughs> Phoenix. And it was literally the most <laughs> riveting hour of TV that I've ever watched. <laughs> you guys think I'm kidding, but honestly, Google it. It was in two. It was an hour plus of these cops. Trying I don't to even get know it, what this is. And it was awesome. And it turned out that the one llama was the other one's mother, and they got separated Aww. at one point. And it was just a shit show. And these cops were trying to, you know, get them. And then the greatest ending of it. Uh, I'm spoiler alert. So if you don't want to know what happened, just don't hit fast, fast forward. forward. But it's like <laughs> these cops are working hard, and it's taking forever. And then these two guys, this guy shows up in the back of a pickup. 
and he's literally like la- he's got a lasso going like lasso or whatever it is oh and he does it first shot nails the llama and he got the mother and then the baby just came it was awesome all right last question well, before <laughs> on that note please ask the king of crayons what is the easiest mistake to make when reading charts oh there are many of these mistakes that one can make um so I, I think um, the one biggest mistake we always do is uh, we all have biases and we are always looking the, – the biggest mistake in technical analysis is having the bias going into the chart. And then you're just looking to find a reason in the chart to confirm your bias. And rather than allowing the, the price action and the tape and the way that the price is behaving – do all the talking, uh, and I'm I've I've fallen victim to this. Like I have a problem ever being bearish gold and things like this, right? Like it's you you basically look at the chart, and sometimes I have to catch myself, and it's like no, you have to be objective and 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 observe chart. But it's so hard because uh, we always are doing that. But the other big mistake I think a lot of people do is um, disconnecting the charts from things like fundamentals and macro. Uh, I, I feel that, you know, while there are intraday traders and active traders that are just dry, uh, literally clipping liquidity and they're just moving, uh, in, you know, as markets bounce around, they're grabbing at things. And that's OK. But but when you're stepping back and looking at the, the, the kind of uh, more bigger picture charts, there are underpinning trends that happen for a reason. And you don't want to talk your way out of uh, of a trade with some short-term squiggles when there are underpinning macro conditions that are driving a primary trend. Uh, and you, you have to be able to kind of com- compile it all together. The beautiful thing about technical analysis in general is that fundamentals and macro tell you what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, technical analysis bridges that by telling you when should you care because it's starting right now. Like you're, 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 uh, you're building thesis and, 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 dr- uh, and building a storyline, but you're looking at the price action to tell you when everyone else gives a shit. Because you can turn around and do the fundamental analysis and follow into the value trap of stock that you think has just got a good valuation. But if no one else gives a shit, then the stock's never going to go up, right, Kev? You like, got uh, it, Patrick. It's, it's, uh, you, it, there's a blend of, of, of trying to get uh, – it, it, there's a place for it in the overall trading process, and uh, that's why I'm a big fan of it. All right, Lena, why don't you tell people where they can send in their questions? <laughs> If you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, please submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Okay, All this right. is the time where I do the outro, but we're just going to. Patrick, it's been a blast, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Where can they find you? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Patrick Sresna or at uh, bigpitchtrading.com. Kev, where can they find they you? You can buddy? check me out at Kevin Muir on Twitter or the macrotourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many times. Too many times, too many friends on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. All right, let me uh, rate this beer. Okay, you do that because I'm fading. You're fading. Oh, shit. <laughs> well, for those who don't, is, I'll week. tell everyone what happened. Uh, you tell us the beers and then I'll tell everyone what's happening and then we'll call it a night. So you, you know what? Uh, like... I've drank a lot of different ales, right? And uh, there's a lot of ones that are, are relatively crisp and nice, clean drinking. This one has a, a, a strange bitterness to it, and um, and almost like a, a it leaves almost like a, a strange kind of weird silkiness or something on your tongue. It it, it does. It, I it, out of just using ales, this is. Uh, not a great ale. Uh, oh my god! Get to the rating. Yeah, exactly. He's fading. I'm gonna give this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give it a five point eight. Okay. Jesus, like I can't. Oh. I. I'm the only one scoring. Can I not just have my moment? <laughs> <laughs> so I heard you right. told everyone it was a squash ball to the face. Mm-mm. I don't know if Lena said that. I just said I you was, had a fight with a squash ball. Yeah, well, I got in a fight with. And the, you lost. I got a fight with the wall. <laughs> <laughs>
So for those who don't want to know, I was playing double squash. I went across to the other side because I was running to cover for my partner, and I tripped on my own feet. As my partner told me, uh, who I chat with, uh, he's one of my buddies that I chat markets with, he told me, I said, didn't I trip on the other guy, like the other opponent? He goes, no, no, you tripped on your own feet. So it was <laughs> just a very unclassy, straight head first. I tripped and then fell straight into the wall. Um, I definitely sat there for a bit. I did not black out, but I, I played the rest of the game. I thought I was okay. I had a bad headache. I went home. I went to bed. I woke up at 3 in the morning. And remember when you, like, played the Century Club at uh, university, Patrick? <laughs> No, I don't. That, that's the problem. I don't ever remember. So, for those who don't know what the Century, Century Club, Club is, it's you take a <laughs> shot of beer every minute, and you're not allowed to pee, and you get really drunk, and you end up the room spinning. So this is what happened to me. I woke up, the room was spinning. I went downstairs. I had a drink. I came back upstairs. The room was still spinning like a mother. I uh, told my wife we gotta go to the hospital. I went to the hospital. I ended up doing all the fun things that are associated with nausea and dizziness for a while. And they ended up telling me I had a concussion, and I, oh, for good measure, I also fractured my wrist, the same one that I cracked up uh, mountain biking. biking. They did have a good laugh at all the, the, how kind of deformed and all the scarring that was there from the previous accident. Um, and then I uh, proceeded to go, and everyone says you're not supposed to sleep, but the, if you, anyone who's had a concussion now knows that it's actually as much sleeping as you can in the first 48 hours is hugely important. I slept literally 22 hours of the 24 hours. And uh, I, I think I slept for four days straight. I barely got out of bed. And uh, then by the weekend, I started to feel a little better. And uh, Monday, I worked half a day uh, and then came home and slept because at lunch, it was too much. And one of my buddies told me I was on the Mediterranean uh, schedule. <laughs> well, okay, but I got to ask you how, like, I, after about seven, eight hours of sleep, I'm just like staring at the ceiling. Were you able to, because of this concussion, actually get real sleep? Well, that, okay, that's, so that's the other fun part. Yes, I did sleep the entire time, and I volunteered for this study, so I was getting quizzed about it. And they say generally, you go through a period where you need tons and tons of extra sleep, and then eventually you actually flip to the opposite, where sleeping can become a problem. I have still not flipped to the opposite. I've just started. <laughs> <laughs> just started. But one of the interesting things was they said to me, uh, oh, you know, they were asking all these questions. And they said, do you have any nightmares or vivid dreams? And I was like, how did you know? And it's even though I'm sleeping, I'm having ter like terrible nightmares. And the guys on my desk asked me if they were trade mares, which I had never heard before. But I think that's kind of a funny line, <laughs> trade mares. Um, no, I used to have trade mares all the time, but I, these were just vivid, weird dreams. And they say that's a common side effect is, is um, vivid like night, night, yeah, terror? like night terrors or whatever. So I've had a lot of those. But then, Patrick, I just go to sleep. Like, it's hard to really explain. Um, I was really sensitive to light, obviously. Like, that was one of the big ones for me. But it seems to be that everyone has different ways they cope with it. Like some people have sensitivity to smells. I didn't have any of that sensitivity to sound. That didn't bother me. But the light just was brutal. Like I like I sat in the dark for three days, sleeping, and I just slept, slept, slept. So, oh, I'm, listen, buddy, I'm really glad that you're back. Uh, I know that better, uh, yeah. you're not 100% yet, so thanks for doing the show. I'm oh, sure no, listen, it was fun, that. and, uh, you know, thank you very much for Jerry. We had to actually put him off the next week, so he was a real trooper, and he appreciated that. And thank you to both you and Lena for understanding and rescheduling and taking care of everything and doing such a terrific job. I hear I'm going oh, to be out buddy. of a Chase. Yes, I, I did already thank Chase on Twitter, but I'll do it as well here. Looks like I'm going to be out of a job soon. <laughs> yeah, well, Chase is great. Yeah, it you was know, terrific. He, he's welcome on the show anytime. Yeah, awesome. I told him, I said, I said, he can be my wingman anytime. And he did the proper response was, bullshit, you can be mine. <laughs> 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 Which I was so worried he wasn't going to know it because he's a little younger than us. And he might not have got it, but he got it. He's quick that, Chase. He knew it either that or he Googled it right away. Speaking of which, <laughs> um, did you guys know that there's a new Top Gun coming? That, that's been known it's information like a, for like, like a long time. Oh, no, no, but I it's finally know, announced, right. like the date. It's coming this summer or whatever. So, Really? Yeah. So, Wait, is this with like original cast? Well, yeah. Well, first of all, Tom Cruise is there. 
And then, do you know what? You know, because the guy never yeah. ages. <laughs> he, he doesn't age. You're absolutely right. But you know, one of the interesting things is Goose's son is in it, and he's that guy from Divergent that is got voted the the actor you'd most likely want to punch in his face. Really? Yeah. Which which the the Divergent the the bad dude that's always cheating and doing the bad things, and that's Goose's son, and he looks just as annoying in this as he was in Divergent. Oh my it's God. like he's typecast. Oh, Anyways, I want to go home. To I want actually, it yeah. is it is it's uh, seven o'clock. It's time for bed for me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Anyway, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for all your well wishes, and thank you for understanding when the show was a little different last week. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, thanks yeah, to everyone. Get better, Kev. I will. Hopefully next week. You know, if this one was already a better week, and then hopefully it just continues that way. All right. Take well, care, have everyone. a great one, everyone, and uh, have a great weekend, Kevin, Lena. Okay, bye bye.